Hey robot fans, welcome back to the build. Last time we got the arms all set up and today we are going to focus on the legs because it's leg day. And ladies and gentlemen, you never skip leg day. Here are all the leg parts we're going to be working with in this video. I'm going to gloss over most of the preliminary trimming of all the parts. If you want to see more about that, be sure to check out the arms video which came out right before this one where I go into more detail. Instead, we're going to start getting right into the fitting process and dealing with what makes each one of these leg pieces unique and challenging. Like the thighs here, for example. Getting these fitted was super easy and very similar to how the upper arms fit together. Once they were fitted and trimmed down to the correct size, I added in five of my little ABS shims using ABS sludge to glue them down. I tried to place them near the top and the bottom as close as I could and one extra one in the middle on the long side. When these were properly dried, I added some ABS slurry to each of the tabs and clamped down the front half of the thigh piece. There was some gappage in between, so I added a vertical shim between my horizontal ones, and in the end, everything fit together really nice. Since the top of the thigh is more visible, I really paid more attention to making sure that those two edges lined up, which left me with a little bit of a disjointed bottom. Rather than take the easy route and hack off the excess, I decided to build up the shorter side and give a little more shape to the bottom edge. Using a combination of little ABS shims and sludge, I just melty glued these layers until the edge was totally built up. This makes a mess of the nice clean thigh surface, but after a few minutes of power sanding, followed by a little bit of good old fashioned hand sanding, we can see that these edges come out really nice. With the edges all clean, I used some Bondo to fill the rest of the seam and further clean up that edge. When that was all done, I began my usual paint process which we discussed in the last video and got all the thighs painted out to a nice smooth white using Krylon for fusion plastics. With that done, now we can begin to add in some of the 501st blue. The CRL calls for two half inch stripes running down the outside of each of the thigh pieces spaced about three quarters inch apart. The stripe in the back runs almost the full length of the thigh armor, stopping only 1 8 inch below the top, but the front stripe stops short of the top by a full inch and a half. The real trick here is making sure these stripes appear vertical when you're standing straight. I did probably a dozen tapings of these stripes to get it right, but I think I finally landed them where I wanted. I covered the majority of the back of the leg with brown paper and masked out my lines with standard blue painter's tape. Before I hit the thigh with the blue paint, I did an extra layer of white to seal up any cracks and imperfections in my taping. This step is super important, so I will keep on mentioning it as I go. I follow that up with a few coats of Krylon Global Blue. This is the blue that we are using to get that screen accurate 501st blue color. When that's all dry, I peel off the tape and paper to reveal our fresh to death blue stripes. Now comes the best part of any and all paint jobs, the weathering. I've done several videos now that involve weathering, and my goal here really is to try to emphasize one portion of what I'm doing each time I show it in hopes that I cover everything over the course of this little build series. I have two main inspirations for weathering, and they are both fellow Commander Bow builders. First up is David Von Thune. His bow build is fantastic, and the part of his painting that I love the most is his airbrush vignetting that he does. He has a strong gradient outline around all of his parts that really adds a nice contrast to the overall look. I try to mimic this style both with an airbrush and with a lot of manual dry brushing. The dry brushing gives it a rougher look than just the straight airbrush, which I happen to like, but the general vignetting idea is very similar. My second inspiration is the master clone builder himself, Commander Gatz. Gatz's painting technique is just out of this world. He uses strong, strong contrast with his weathering using hand-painted scuffs and blaster marks. He's a real artist with the way he lays down these marks. I try to do my best to do something similar, but I feel like I can never achieve the same level of realism that he does. But hey, I've got a lot of clone real estate here to practice on. You may notice that I also didn't mask out any battle damage on the thighs with the liquid latex like we did with the helmet and the shoulders. This is another Gats method that I'm sort of adopting. He doesn't use any of that type of masking anywhere, not even on the helmet. His chips and scrapes are all hand done right on top of the blue. I did this for my forearm in the last video and really loved the way it looked, so I'm going to continue that for the legs since, like the forearms, we are only dealing with small stripes here. My goal for all of this weathering is to form a bit of a hybrid between David and Gatz using the strong artistic contrast of Gatz's battle damage and the heavy vignetting of David's style. My personal process for adding in these hand-painted Gatz style scuffs isn't totally straightforward. It's a process of painting and wiping away, then tracing, then wiping, then painting, then tracing, then wiping, on and on and on. I find that if I just paint a blaster mark, it looks very hand-painted and super lame. 
So I wipe it away and the remnant left behind by wiping the paper towel is usually a lot more organic. Or at least it seems a lot more organic to me since I didn't directly hand paint it myself. I then try to trace that organic shape with the next brush strokes and keep repeating until I have a pretty organic looking mark. I may come back later and remove the whole thing, or change a little portion, or sand off most of it, or some combination. Like I said, it's not a very straightforward process for me. The contrast is so heavy that it always seems to be way too much while you're doing it, so sometimes it's good to walk away for a bit and come back. But if you look at a lot of other clones out there, in close-up pictures their weathering looks nice and subtle and great, but then when you see a shot of them at an event from 10 feet away, or under the bright lights of a photo shoot, it all gets washed out and looks super clean. So the heavy contrast will pay dividends in my future convention pictures. In fact, one way that I check on my weathering while I'm doing it is to literally look at my armor through the camera on my phone. You'd be amazed how different it looks. When I'm happy with my GAT style blaster marks, I bust out the airbrush and add in the Thune-like vignetting that I love so much. It's really easy to overdo it on this step, so have some restraint, but for me the vignetting is where it's at. I also like to accentuate the dark blast marks I made with the airbrush to give a little bit of a scorched look. Technically, it lowers the contrast a little since I'm adding a bit of a gradation, but I feel like the look of the burn from the blaster more than makes up for it. With all the weathering done, the last thing we need to do for these thighs is install some strapping. My Imperial Surplus Order came with this big old belt that goes around my waist and these two looped straps that hang down to hold up our thighs. The straps come with the hook side of some velcro sewn on, so I just need to install some carpet side into the front of my thighs. I can see myself converting this to a snap based system in the future, but for now I like the versatility of the velcro as I find out what placement works best for me. With all these attached, the thighs hold nicely into place and we can start getting a feel for how this armor is going to fit. Abraham Lincoln once said, the knees are just the elbows of the legs, and as such, the knees are very similar in construction to the elbows. Here's all the parts we're going to be using for the knees. We have the KW hard armor part. I also bought the foam insert kit, which will fit right behind there. Each knee has two of these resin clips that go on the outside of the straps. And for the straps, we have, again, a structural strap. This is just a runner's knee strap. It has a Velcro closure, so that'll help hold secure to the knee. And we have the aesthetic strap, which is a foam piece and an elastic piece. Both of these pieces come in a 30 inch strip, which I just cut in half. I did a bit of a dry assembly here. So you could see how the clip, this resin clip is gonna glue to the hard part and gonna poke up against the back of the strap. The strap is going to be the foam with the elastic band. The elastic band is really just like an aesthetic piece. It's just gonna give it a gray strap on top of the white foam. And then if we uh, look inside here, we can take this off now. The structural strap is going to fit behind the knee pad, very similar to the way we did the elbows. And this is Velcro so that when we go to put it on, we just have a nice little Velcro strap that we can put on. And then we'll come up with a way to close the aesthetic strap over it so you don't really see that. The trimming and sanding of these knee parts is a breeze because you can basically use the foam insert as a stencil just like we did with the elbows. Once these are trimmed out, we can start the finishing process on those as we prepare all of the internal guts. Let's start with the structural strap. First we have to trim the strap a bit. These straps have these little foam blocks that press against the knee. We obviously don't need or want that so we can hack it off with some scissors to make the strap nice and flat. Like we showed before, this needs to fit behind the foam insert, so we will also need a cutout on the ridge of the foam piece to allow the strap to pass through uninterrupted. I just centered the strap on both ends, made a pencil mark on the ridge, and cut it with an X-Acto. Now the strap can pass through cleanly and doesn't block the foam padding from getting into the plastic. We also need to make a pretty deep cutout for the strap ends to come out of the sides, otherwise they will pull the foam off of the armor when we tighten it. The Imperial Surplus Foam Kit has a nice strap indication here that we can use as a guide to just remove this entire section. Now we can see that the ends here don't get pulled off when we tighten the strap. After doing a couple test fits, I found that the foam wasn't really seated well inside of the plastic, which was likely due to the strap itself, so I cut a full strap-sized ridge into the foam so there is no overhang. After that, the foam sat much nicer inside the plastic. Next up we have the clips. These clips are made of resin and are very straight. We need to add a little bit of curvature to them so that they can follow the line of the armor and the foam insert. 
I turned my 3D printer bed all the way up to 135 degrees and let them sit on there for a few minutes. This really softened them up way more than I expected, so this is great. After that, I just pressed them a bit around the outside of this super cool coffee mug, and I got some nice curvature to them. I sprayed them down along with the hard armor shells to a nice smooth white. Now it's time to mask these off for the blue paint. The CRL calls for a blue stripe that is about 1 and 1 fourth inch thick and comes to a point in the center of the knee. I made some measurements and some markings along the way at the 1 and 1 quarter inch mark and then began to lay down my painter's tape. I started with the thinnest tape I had which allows for a little bit of curvature as you lay it down. I followed that up with different thicknesses of standard blue painter's tape until everything was masked off. I sprayed down my masked off knee with a quick coat of white to hopefully seal up any imperfections in my tape lines and after that was dry I started hitting it with the blue. After everything was dry, I peeled off the tape to reveal the blue. This is definitely one of the best parts of the paint job, seeing the masked off sections come to life. Next we can install our freshly painted foam inserts. To paint these, I used SEM Vinyl Coat in Carver White. I placed our structural strap in the recess and began gluing down all of the edges of the foam using this Bob Smith CA glue, which is made especially for foam. Now we have to install the clips. These will be glued to the armor part, but first we have to do a little work. When we fully removed the padding from the foam insert, we also removed what is supposed to be a bit of a spacer. If we look at this picture from the Imperial Surplus website, these clips aren't supposed to be butted right up against the armor, but sit back just a bit. As far as functionality, this is a pretty negligible difference, but aesthetically, I really like the way it looks with the space between. It gives it a lot of extra dimension. I printed a little spacer piece that will fill that space, but still leave some room for the support strap to come in from underneath. These spacers are 3mm thick versus the KW foam, which was about 5mm thick. This will give me a little more room for my knee, which I think will be helpful based on my test fits. The spacer is going to line up with the top of the armor piece, and the clip is going to line up with the top of the spacer at the base of this indented design. We can see here that this will leave a little overhang on the clip, so I'm going to cut this off on an angle to allow more room for the strap to go around the knee. I then glued everything together to make a clip, spacer, foam, armor chunk that all fits within the footprint of the outside of the armor. The last bit here is the cosmetic strap. It's been a few days since I painted the foam, and with just the minor wear and tear of assembling the knee, this paint is already chipping like crazy. The strap is an even more dynamic piece since it has to bend and will constantly be taken on and off, so I have a feeling I'm going to be dealing with chipping paint for the rest of my life. I decided to opt away from the foam and bought a 1.5 inch white leather belt. In addition to already being white on the outside, it's a little thinner than the foam belt, which again will allow more room for my knee inside of the assembly. I'm also not super in love with this elastic strap. Darkling is a clone builder I follow on Instagram and he posted this picture of his knees and wow, I love the look of some nice webbing on top of that white strap. I bought this 5 8 inch herringbone webbing from Amazon and began the process of making it gray. I tried dyeing it with Rit Black dye for an hour. It didn't do a whole lot, but this might be a nice enough base that I can lay down some light coats of gray paint and even with the inevitable chipping it'll still look gray. I used two gray paints for this. The first was a Rust-Oleum 2-in-1 primer, which is like a light gray, and the second is a Duplicolor automotive paint that I had on hand, which is a lot darker, and I just kept spraying layers of each until I found a mix between the two that I really liked. We'll need to paint the inside of the white leather strap too, but before we do that, we need to get it fitted into the knee. I printed these two blocks, just a half inch by half inch square that is about 3 eighths of an inch thick. This is going to lock our strap into place. I glued one of these blocks onto the clip on the inside of the knee, being sure to center it the best I could. I used an X-Acto blade to cut a matching hole into the interior of the strap. We can see here that if we glue down the outside end of the strap, we will have this little keyhole end which we can just hook in and out of place as needed. The pressure of my knee pushing against it will hold it into place, but if that ends up not being enough, I can attach some Velcro to the top of the block and it will latch onto the structural strap. Now we also have a great way to measure how long to cut our belt by hooking it in and seeing where the other end of the strap hits inside of the clip. After cutting the belt to the appropriate length, I painted the insides with the same SEM vinyl coat. When that was dry, I started installing my webbing. One end of the webbing will go right up to the keyhole, the other end will stop short about 3 quarters of an inch from the edge. This will give me space to glue the strap onto the inside of the knee. To install the strap, I cut off the frayed edge of the webbing and use a lighter to melt the nylon together so it won't fray again. 
To glue this, I'm using E6000 glue. This glue is really strong and also flexible, which makes it great for foam and fabric, and in this case, leather. The cure time on this is a little slow, which gives some welcome work time. I let the first side dry for a bit before I started on the second side. To get the second side in the correct position, I bend the strap to mimic how it's going to be bent around my knee in order to mark the other end. It's also a good idea to rough up the leather a little bit before you lay the glue down so it grabs on a little better. Keep checking for the strap to remain flat when it's in the bent and proper position and make sure it's centered throughout the strap. When that's all dry, I use a really thin drill bit to make four small holes at each end right through the glued down portion. I grab my little drugstore sewing kit here and just go in and out of all of the holes until I have a full pattern on the top. I then super glue the ends of the strings so that they don't budge. The last bit here is to glue down the strap on the back of the clip being sure to keep the gray webbing in line with the tab on the front of the clip. With all that strapping done we can move right into the weathering. Nothing really new to see here just doing my Thungatsian weathering style that I love so much. And that's all there is to it folks. Putting these on is super easy and we have a very functional knee assembly. If you're thinking, wow, that is a super clever knee solution, well you're right. But I can't take any credit for it. This whole runner's knee strap keyhole strap assembly is the brainchild of none other than Commander Gats, who we talked about earlier. He's been kind of guiding me through this whole armor building process. I mentioned in the last video how generous he has been with his time and his help, and now with this second armor video, that is only doubly true. A huge thanks to Gats for answering all my thousands of questions and showing me some really cool building techniques along the way. Next up we have the lower legs. These are the most interesting and challenging piece of the leg armor. If you buy your kit from Imperial Surplus it will come with an additional back or calf piece for each leg. This is because we need to cheat a little bit. If you look at the perfectly CG'd clone troopers from episode 3, they all wear this lovely knee to ankle armor which fits snugly against each part of their leg. In real life it's just flat out impossible to slip your foot through a contoured piece of leg armor like that so we'll need to make a little trap door to sneak our foot through and cover it all back up later so anyone looking at the costume is none the wiser. This trapdoor is known as the spoon in the clone builders community and for at least one clone builder it's the most dreaded part of the build. Things start innocently enough with the trimming and the fitting just like all the other parts. I attended a local armor building party and CT19812 here helped me get them all fitted and sorted out. It's always nice to have someone who's done this before help you with the hard parts. Before I glue these halves together I'm going to remove the area at the back of the calf which will eventually reveal our spoon. I'm going to call this area the scoop, and in order to make my scoop, I need to draw a cut line around the spoon right at the edge, leaving just a little hint of a return. Then I started snipping. I really want this cut to be super clean, and I don't trust my wandering Dremel hand on something this crucial. So I used big, heavy aviation clippers to cut the bulk, and then I got really precise with some small snippers to hug that cut line as best as I could. When all that was done, I polished off my jaggies with a Dremel and finished it with some hand sanding. Back inside now, you can see what we're going for here. If we place our scoop right over our spoon, we can get a glimpse of what the final leg is going to look like. With the scoops done, we can glue the two halves together. I went the more traditional route here and used the excess from my original pieces to make a perfectly contoured seam shim and glued and clamped that tight. With one of these shims running the length of each seam, it's just a matter of doing some solid clamping to get the two halves together. With our scoop set up and drying, we can start with the spoon. The Imperial Surplus website has this handy little button which brings up pictures of all of the assembled armor, including some really helpful shots of the spoon making process. This process involves cutting our extra calf piece not only into a spoon, but also into the spoon mounting pieces, which includes a stop plate and a lock tab. I drew my cut lines for the three parts and got them all cut out and smoothed off. The key here is to get the stop plate to match the contour of the top of your spoon. This way, when you insert your spoon, it has a nice curve to fit into. Next we need to glue on the lock tab. The lock tab will hang over the bottom edge of the stop plate to hold the spoon into place when it's inserted. The installation of our plate tab assembly is a bit tricky. I put my spoon in the general position I want it to be in, I load up my stop plate with some ABS slurry and then try to align it perfectly on top of the spoon while keeping the spoon in the desired final position. 
there is the original placement and then there's going to be a lot of little minute adjustments as I use up all the work time the slurry gives me before it's too hard to move. When things are starting to firm up a bit, I remove the spoon and clamp down the stop plate to let it dry. When it's all dry, we can do a test fit of our spoon and see that it's working pretty awesomely. It's sticking out just a touch further than I'd like, but that's an easy fix just from sanding a bit off the top of the spoon. The real mess on our hands comes here at the bottom. Our spoon and our scoop are miles away from each other and the ends aren't lined up at all. We need to install the Imperial Surplus track system to line them up a bit better. If you order your kit from Imperial Surplus, it comes with some extra sheets of 2mm ABS. You can use this sheet to make four 2 inch by 1 and 1 quarter inch rectangular tabs. Cut those out and sand them down nice and smooth on all four corners and all eight edges. We are going to glue these tabs down to our seam shims creating a nice little pocket pointing towards the scoop. This will catch the edges of the spoon and hold it in the proper place. The trick is to line up the edge of the spoon with the edge of the shim so the spoon has a natural resting place and the tab is just holding it in that spot. When that's done, I sand down the seam area and the back of the tab and then glue them and clamp them down. When that's dry, you can see from our test fit here that you can insert the spoon through the scoop, pull it back through the tracks that we just inserted, and then pop the top under the lock tab. Now our spoon is in place, but it looks like the scoop and the spoon are still not meeting up really well and there is a lot of gappage. To get rid of this, we will need to manually bend and reform the plastic using some heat. Using some painter's tape, I close the gap in the scoop way beyond where it needs to go. I use a lot of pressure and apply enough tape to hold everything down. Now we can start heating. As someone who has destroyed a lot of 3D printed BB-8 parts trying to heat them into place, let me offer you some sage advice here. Keep your heat gun on the lowest setting it has. Heat the part slowly. It takes a long time to heat up and that is a good thing. Gradually bring the temperature up over not only the edges that need to be bent, but all around. Make sure you get where it's flexing to make the bend possible. Use your hand to check the temperature often. You don't want it to get too, too hot. And most importantly, leave the tape on until well after it has cooled. Don't let the plastic snap back until it's back to room temperature. You can see from our first heat here that things are already moving closer together but are still a long way off. I repeated this heating step about five times or so for each leg, even inserting the spoon and taping it into the scoop nice and tight to help form the plastic. At the end you can see we have a much nicer fit on both legs. With the dreaded spoon assembly behind me, I breathed a little sigh of relief and began my finishing process to get the lower legs to a nice smooth white. The 501st blue on the lower legs is very similar to the thighs in that we are just continuing our two half inch stripes all the way down the sides. I did the same brown paper masking tape solution as I did with the thigh pieces. I did a coat of white to hopefully seal up any cracks left in my tape job and then did a few coats of the blue to give us our final piece of blue in the legs. Weathering the lower legs isn't anything too out of the ordinary. I did my usual dry brushing and GATS style lines, but before I did any of the airbrushing, I wanted to get the boots into the mix. I bought these boots from Geo over at Crow Props. Generally speaking, they are really nice and really well made, but that's not to say they are perfect. My main complaint is the tongue of the boot has way too much material. It hangs off the front of the foot really far, and when I was trying to fit the lower leg over the top, it always got snagged on a big chunk of material from the side of the tongue. It just needs to have less material. My secondary complaint is that the strap here is a little bush league. There's this really thin leather disc greebly on it rather than a full thick actual greebly, so we'll need to fix that. I don't really have any desire to try to modify a leather boot myself, but I figured I'd give my local tailor a stab at it. I marked up some cuts for the sides of the tongue to get rid of all that extra material, and I also added a mark for a slit down the middle. If we look at the boots you can get from Imperial Boots, they have this nice cut down the center which would allow the tongue to fold over itself if necessary underneath the leg armor. I think I'm going to add that onto my crow prop boots. I also hacked off the strap before I handed it over to the tailor so that I could start my work on that while the boots are getting altered. I cut off that leather circle and measured out the space of the holes. Then I modeled a better boot disc and printed out four of them at about 40 millimeters wide which should cover the holes from the stitching. I did my usual finishing and painting process to get these to a costume ready level. Right about this time I got the boots back from the tailor and they look great. They recreated the stitching really nice around the new tongue material so this is perfect. 
As I put the discs on, I realized that the orientation is a little counterintuitive. You'd think that the line on the disc would be in line with the strap, but actually it runs parallel to the ground. So I velcroed the strap into place and then glued the disc on so I can make sure that the line in the disc was parallel to the sole of the boot. Just like with the lower legs, I began weathering the boots on their own. As I kind of expected, the paint doesn't stick super well to the shiny leather here, so I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge. I got things to a certain level of dirty and then brought the lower legs back into the mix to do some combination weathering to make sure things flowed nicely. I had to go pretty deep with the darkening of the boots to make the shiny white leather match the matte white legs a little better. I kept putting all the leg armor together to make sure it was nice and cohesive and I think I finally got everything to a spot where it looks like it goes together. Alright, all the leg armor is on for the first time, this is awesome. Um, it was pretty tricky getting it on for that first time, but not too bad. There's some fit issues I could take care of. I think I'm going to tighten up this belt and maybe make these pinch in a little bit more. I want the knee pads to point up a little bit more, so I might adjust the padding there. I need to sand the tracks on the spoons. I think I got some paint in there while I was doing some of my color work. But other than that, this is great. Uh, <laughs> I can walk fairly normally which is cool, much more than I thought I'd be able to. Everything's pretty comfortable. I'm gonna get the rest of the armor on and see the whole picture right now. Alright, that's going to do it for this video. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I know there was a huge gap between the arms video and the legs video, but fear not, that is not going to happen again. Uh, I have a major goal right now to finish this entire build by New York City Comic Con 2019, which is a mere two months away from the recording of this video, so there's a lot to be done. I have a few videos already in progress for some of the accessories. Next up, we're going to do the girdle region, which is the cod piece, the butt piece, and the ab piece, so stay tuned for that. Um, beyond that, I think these videos are getting a little bit long. Maybe the legs video is a little too long, so I'm going to start breaking everything up into smaller parts, putting out more videos, and even if I miss that New York City Comic Con deadline, there'll definitely be a lot of content between now and then, so stay tuned for that. And as always, we are going to finish with a progression shot. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time.